suitcases bulging. We have a whole lot to unpack on. Ingle Radio, the podcast presented by The Hockey Shop, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Our feature interview this week is a Luongo, Leo Luongo, and we'll get into his backstory. Uh, of course, uh, the brother of Roberto Luongo, incredible coaching uh, journey for Leo and our Gear segment this week, we'll deal with the Hyperlite Chesty from Bauer as we check in with Cam Matwev uh, after we connect with the guys uh, back from the Net360 camp uh, up in Kelowna, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison. Uh, how was uh, things in the Okanagan, and uh, are you guys uh, ready to put on your skates again after a little bit uh, of time off? It's I'm going to need I'm going to a little time here. Like uh, it's I don't know how coaches do it, man. Like especially the guys that work the summer camp says what like Hutch, we're in the skates for about five hours a day. And those guys and well, you do it at Eli's camp. You, you're like eight, nine hours a day. I don't I did Those were some I long got comfy days. skates. I got custom fit. Thank you, CCM. My skates have been customized to my foot, but those are long days to spend all in skates. Hutch, like. What's it like uh, when you go back and, and, you, and you're in that environment of a net 360 camp? Well, I, I think I said it before when we talked about the old Carey Price days with Eli Wilson. It's uh, we feel so privileged and have to remind ourselves as we get in there and just feel so comfortable because we're we're going home again. Almost, you know, it feels like a, a place we well, it is a place we go every year. Uh, we love the people that are there and we feel so welcome. And you just sort of have to shake yourself and remember what it was like the first time you were there, surrounded by all these great goaltenders, great coaches, so many exciting things happening everywhere. And, and you know, we were a little bit, to use the Pete Fry term, in the fan mindset in years uh, one and two with Net360, with Carey Price. And, uh, and now, now it just feels like home, and it's really exciting. It's one of those features of every summer for us. We look forward to it because so much happens on the ice and it's there's a there's a goalie camp going on there as you might imagine there's a station and there's goaltenders and coaches and they're working drills with some great shooters but there's so much more because of the level of the coaches and the goaltenders the experience of them all that these little conversations are happening all the time and Woody and I will be there. We've got our cameras on the ice and we've got the coaches mic'd up and sometimes we've got the goalies mic'd up and you just sort of be watching a drill as as the, the focus would be, you would expect. And then you see this conversation happening over the side with an NHL goaltender and a couple of NHL coaches and you think, oh, what's going on there? You sort of slide the camera over because you know that when you get home, you want to check that video and find out what was happening in that conversation. And they're great. We would be welcome to stick our nose into that conversation uh, to hear what's going on. But we want to spend our, our time a little bit away from that and maybe check out what's going on later. So those conversations are, you know, technical things, for example, uh, to use one that's come up quite a bit recently is is conversations about how do you handle a short side shot? Just as, as one example of something that came up and a lot of goaltenders today. And I, I know at Eli's camp, he was teaching the same thing. Take it off the pad, predictably puts it into the corner. And yet there's a conversation going on where some coaches were bringing it up with uh, Laurent Brassois saying, maybe you want to try this. And he was then explaining the rationale for why he likes to get a stick involved. And it had to do with team systems, expectations in Vegas. And, uh, and, those little things I find just really fascinating and some one of the best parts of uh, of the whole week for us. We had one of those on Friday too, the last day. Uh, some a lot of dead angle work and net play and post integrations with uh, on the pro side. The station I was set up at for for pretty much the whole day was Martin Jones, newly of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and James Reimer with Brady Robinson, who's longtime now goaltending coach uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers, like development goaltending coach, works with the Lehigh Phantoms. Uh, and it was just Rhymes and Martin Jones, the way they use windows in terms of finding pucks behind the net and tracking pucks behind the net and staying on pucks behind the net, two totally different things. And there was a lot of back and forth, not only with the coach, uh, Ryan Sear was also there coaching as well. Those Those four... But really between James and Jones, where, you know, James is trying some new things and Jones is on the back of the net being like, hey, that was cleaner. That was better. He had nothing. Just tip your hat. Guy's going to make a shot. Stuff like that. 
Um, James experimenting. Well, at the time he was experimenting with skates. He was in connects for the first time, but also experimenting with, you know, skate on post versus toe bridge on post. And um, just again, that conversation, the back and forth, you know, how sometimes a decision on how you're going to play things can be based on like, man, I got ripped twice short side and I never get ripped short side. And well, okay, but sometimes guys just pick spots. And if it happens twice in a year, do you change how you do everything if it hasn't happened in the previous five, just because two guys managed to find a spot or got lucky or so it, it fascinating to be in on those conversations. We can't wait to share them with Ingold Premium members. You'll be able to basically sit back and listen like we did and watch them as they figure these things out together. Uh, also pretty cool to be part of a conversation. The pros had extra ice. So every day they would be out uh, 11 to 12 30 hour and a half session was the official but then the ice like the the, the ice maker didn't come on till one so they had an extra half hour out there and rhymes went into the locker room and he comes back out in a different set of pads i think this is i want to say hutch like day two or three and he comes to the net mm-hmm. and he was basically trying to decide darren what equipment to wear next year now he's in a hyper light too But there are different versions, different thicknesses. We've talked about the new Hyperlite 2, how thin it is, the profile on the stock retail pad. Well, James is a guy who wears a thicker pad traditionally, right? And so the pros have the option of going back to previous builds or combinations of old builds and new builds. And he was trying to figure out whether to switch to the newer, thinner ones, which he'd been wearing for the first two ice sessions, or go back to the, the sort of thicker, stiffer build that he's used in the past. And so just to sit in on that conversation... Frankly, to be part of that conversation, he's asking us questions as he's in the net, going back and forth into reverse. Uh, Thomas Spear, who was his goaltending coach for the San Jose Sharks last year, was there with us. And it's a conversation. like It's a back and forth. He's asking us questions about how things look, um, how it presents, uh, opinions, what we're hearing on different pads and how they react. Uh, and it was just like, it's just kind of cool. Right, just kind of cool to be sitting there with an NHL guy, a, a, an experienced veteran NHL guy, as he tries to figure out whether he's going to make a switch in his equipment, and he's talking it through with you, right? Like he's talking through that process, asking you questions, and and basically making up his mind. And I think when we started asking him questions, it was some of the answers he gave us instinctually that was kind of like, well, there's your answer. You know, if that's what you feel most kind of like, hey, like you know. I think you just answered your own question, right? So really neat. And James, here's another one. Toe ties, right? Like Rhymes uh, has, a, he's gone to a combination. We've kind of teased him over the years. He's had every kind of toe lock and plastic device on his pads to try and get, you know, he likes a bungee feel. He likes something that he feels snaps his pad back over the middle of the skate when he gets out of the butterfly. Otherwise, it feels sloppy to him. He likes to feel connected. But obviously, toe bridge reverse VH doesn't work as well with a bungee because there's some give when you go to push off the post. And he was talking about that. So now he's in, it's like about an inch of bungee and then it goes to skate lace. So he's found a combination of the two. So just again, to be, so be part of that conversation of why and why he thinks it works, what he likes about it and why he can't go away from it. Right. When we're telling him, Hey, like you're always going to have a little bit of lost energy coming off that post in a toe lock. If you've got these on and he's like, that's fine much like the Brassois conversation about using his stick on those low shots, there's a reason for it. And so to be part of those conversations and it's, it's, it's just really cool. Like it's, it's, it's flattering to be on the ice with these guys and, and capture it. It's even more flattering when they're asking you what you see and for your opinion. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing for them to bring us into that world. I think there's a couple of really good lessons there, right? Is that, In the in the age of the internet, you know, you put something up on Instagram or Twitter, and people are quick to hop on the comments and say, This is wrong, that's wrong, this is the only way to do it. And then you get on the ice with the best in the business, and there's a dialogue happening, everybody understanding that there's many ways to do things, that there's advantages and disadvantages, to hear some of the insights that that we hadn't considered. We've been around this game for a very long time, and every time we're out there with these guys, something pops up that I hadn't considered before, and it's a a great opportunity to learn and just recognize that there's multiple ways to do things. And and the other one for me that I think is a really good lesson for young goaltenders is that it's important to have a dialogue with your coach. Um, What was it Ian Clark said, Kevin, was you have to be your own best goalie coach. Uh, And I I think that's part of this, this, 
the fact that these guys and these coaches are able to have a dialogue, that's sort of the mature level of a coach athlete relationship. And as a young goaltender, I think you need to work towards that. Uh, so many young goalies in camp just do what they're told, have no questions, get in the net, leave the net. It's okay to go to a coach, even if you're 10 years old and say, I don't quite understand what you want from me there. Or why is it you're doing this? Because I have a coach at home that says I should do it this way. And I don't mean to be, you're not doing it to be argumentative. You're not getting in there with a coach and saying, no, my coach at home says this is the right way. And that is the right way. It's just understanding that it's, it's mature to have a dialogue. And, and I see coaches in kids camp, I see their eyes light up when they get an opportunity to have a dialogue with a young goaltender. Um, it's, it's a great way for both sides to learn. And that's exactly what we see happening at Net360 when there's this collaborative environment between athlete and coach. It's, it's a mature way to work and it's a way to bring your game to a new level. I want to get into what we expect to see on InGoal. Uh, from your content that you guys acquired there, but uh, had heard a couple of names. Uh, give me an idea of, of who you guys were working with, uh, Woody. Well, let's. I was just going to say, as Hutch was talking about sort of only one way to do things or the internet comments, like that's why ProReads started, right? Like that's the whole reason we started ProReads was because you would see the internet warriors being like, ah, he did this wrong. Well, I want to know why he chose that, right? And so having the NHL goalies explain their safe selections to us, and we managed to grab another great um, video session while we were up there with one of the names that, that was already been mentioned, Darren uh, Loren Brassois. So fresh off his day with the Stanley Cup, which for the beginning portion I was at, Hutch was at for the public portion, uh, LB comes up to Kelowna, uh, all four days on the ice. Missed the first day, but he's up there for days two to two to five, and spent close to forty minutes with us in our little coach's room that me and Hutch take over, a little video room, uh, going over saves from his last season, his Stanley Cup winning season with the Vegas Golden Knights. So that's one of the pieces of content, one of the names you can expect to see it in goal. Actually, probably by the time this, not long after you hear this podcast, it'll probably be up already. Uh, Pro reads with Loren Brassois, and he's. You know, again, just everybody approaches it different, right? And so LB's approach, you know, compared to some of the other names that we've had, and it's been just a fantastic summer for Pro Reads at Ingle. So many great names, so many great additions. Uh, another one with Matt Murray up there right now on on screens, just a real how to on 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 how to manage screens. And LB is going to be added to that. And so just to have all these different ways of doing things and takes on things, that'll be up there. Uh, we've got some great tips. Kristen Campbell uh, from Canada's national team, uh, Olympian, was there at the camp uh, with her. They brought in her uh, goalie coach from the national team, Brad Kirkwood out of Calgary, uh, runs top prospects goaltending. And I've had the opportunity to talk to Brad in the past, um, but mostly sort of from the outside as a journalist, like, Watching, I remember being at a women's uh, national. It wasn't a camp. It was part of the series against the USA, one of their one of their rivalry series, uh, where I went over to Victoria and watched a few of their practices and filmed a few of their drills. And Brad walked me through them after and was really well thought out and articulate. And but this is a different level when you're in the room with them, when you're on the ice with them. And man, I came away so impressed with his coaching, and I came away so impressed with her work ethic and her habits. And there are lessons in there that we can't wait to share, not just technically, Darren, but mindset. Um, you know, if a drill starts with a pass, and we'll explain more of this why, and we've got examples and video of it to go with it, but I'll give you a teaser of what's going to, one of the things that's going to come. If a drill starts with a pass, and Kristen's done her reps, or she's not the first goalie up, there's two goalies at every station. When the other goalie's in the net, She's making the first pass. She is making the first pass because it's a chance to get better at puck handling. And that is just one. I, I've, I haven't seen that. Maybe there are other goalie coaches that do this all the time. And, but I hadn't seen that. It's, it's something that Brad Kirkwood in, encourages. Uh, it's part of the system for, for the women's national team for, for, for Hockey Canada, especially when, when goalies like Kristen are in net because she's so good at it. It's how you get better, right? Go back to our conversation with Marty Bruder. How'd you become a great puck handler? Every time I had a chance to handle the puck, I did. Well, here's a chance that every goalie has at most camps when they're not in the net. Rather, do you, do you just take a knee and watch the other guy? 
And there may be value to that, especially if you're, you're talking to the coach and walking through ideas. Do you just sit around and let your mind wander? Or do you grab a puck and, and start being one of the passers to initiate the drill? Just great little examples like that. So Kristen Campbell was there. James Reimer, we've already mentioned. Marty Jones signed a contract with the Toronto Maple Leafs while we were there. Um, trying to think of some of the other names. Beck Warm just signed with the San Jose's uh, AHL team, the San Jose Barracuda. Zane McIntyre looking outstanding. Yeah, Zane McIntyre, who should be in the National Hockey League, yeah. by the way. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm a team, we do this every year. Uh, actually, I end up doing this on my radio hits. Pick a guy that somebody, some team should claim off waivers if they want a guy who's ready for the NHL and, and will have success with him. Uh, last year for me, it was um, Connor Ingram. And he had success with the Arizona Coyotes. I think I'd have Zane McIntyre high on that list two years in a row. Like, you know, I watch him with NHL goaltenders beside him and like, forget looking out of place. He's right there with him, if not at times better. Um, Hey, and shout out, shout out to him and to his uh, coach in, in it's Iowa, right? Richard Bachman. Uh, Richard Bachman. You can see the elevation in Zane's game over the last three years. Like it's, It would be unfair to call it night and day, but there's a huge elevation there through all the work that those two have done together. Yeah. And so um, those two were there and, and, and Thomas Spear was there who was, uh, I mentioned obviously the San Jose Sharks goalie coach worked with Rhymes last year, but Capo Kakinen was there as well. His first year at the camp, uh, San Jose Sharks goaltender, Uh, Beck Warm, I mentioned Clay Stevenson, who's coming off his rookie season in the Washington Capitals organization. I think he's going to take a step up into the, into the American hockey league this year. Uh, with Hershey, he was on the Hershey roster that won the Calder Cup. Um, trying to think of who else. Uh, a whole bunch of junior kids. I'm gonna I'm gonna miss some names, so I'm not even gonna try because I will buy. It would be unfair. Uh, we saw a lot of. We, we happen to be at stations with a lot with Mason Bopit this year. Um, obviously, one Matthew Hutchison was up there with us as well. Uh, always makes the trip enjoyable when we can get his insights after the ice times. Just yeah, there was. <clears throat> I want to say. I think there were eight pros and more. I think eight pro, eight junior. Pro, eight junior. Yeah, so 16 guys. I so, yeah. uh, mentioned Brady Robinson, Ryan Sear, um, Lyndon San Martino. Lyndon San Martino, with, Lucas Gore with from Brassois. Spokane. Yeah, Lucas Gore from Spokane. Um, man, I feel like we're going to miss somebody, and, and I hate to do that, but there's just so many great coaches and so many great goalies up there. It's really, like I said, Despite some of those names, you know, and in, and in the past, you know, like we, we had the Connor Hellebuck's and the Devin Dubnik's, even when we had the biggest names, you know, Hellebuck coming off of Vesna, it was always more than the sum of its parts. And that's what makes the camp fascinating is all the conversations that go on behind the scenes amongst them. Um, that makes it more than just the names that are up there. It's about the atmosphere of sharing and teaching and everyone getting better together that they've created that makes it so fun. What our audience is going to be able to and subscribers are going to be able to dive into is going to really ride the coattails of what you guys were able to acquire with the cameras on the ice. So Hutch, you're you're busy every ice session uh, or would you settle in at one station and really dial into that? A little of both. It's uh, typically one station. I think in the first years, we made the mistake of trying to get everything. We were so excited by everything that was happening around us. Can we get what's going on? This one, this one, this one. And and in more recent years, Woody and I have uh, realized it's probably better to do a really good job at one station than it is to grab too many. So uh, we tend to double team it. Uh, also, coaches tend to have a bit of a theme so that uh, as different goalies work through their station during the week, the, the sessions are never identical, but there's often a little bit of a theme. So we don't need to try and capture everything all in the first day, but we will have at times five different microphones going, four different cameras going. And uh, for us, it's uh, probably we've gotten exponentially better at collecting information and we've just made it exponentially harder on ourselves to produce that into something for someone. But it means there's so much more there. We're able to capture the drill from multiple angles. When there are teaching points there, we're able to capture those little moments that happen, as I mentioned before, just off to the side or maybe at the end of a session as conversations happen. Um, we're going to get better at it every year, I'm sure. But uh, lots of good things that will come out of that. I find personally those little conversations or even some of the just the really simple skating drills that happen at the beginning of a session stuff that uh i can imagine if you were a young coach you would be really shy about those intro little bits working with a pro goaltender 
uh, how do I wow them with every little thing that I do? If you were on the ice or sitting in the rink watching these things, you'd realize that they're doing the basics like you and I are. But at the same time, some of these coaches are bringing new twists on it that we haven't seen before. And, uh, and so those, those chances to bring some of those things to people, uh, we're really excited about. So expect to see some pro tips and pro drills rolling out over the next little while. Um, should mention that we also got to spend some time in the gym with, uh, James Wendlin, who had done that five damn things for the, uh, for the hips that he, that we put up on in goal a while ago has been super popular, uh, since we got it up there and he had a couple of more five damn things uh, sessions that he did, uh, working with Kristen Campbell and, uh, and Maddie, and, uh, we'll have those up fairly soon as well. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that'll drip, drip, come out in dribs and drabs over the next, uh, days, weeks, and months. Woody. I was just going to say like, uh, a lot of coaches have new things. Some of them have old things. How about the Nabokov special? Some of Jenny Nabokov. Yes. I should have been new to me. Skating, right. Yeah. Russian skating drills that we'll probably try and get up, uh, like first and foremost it really is fascinating to watch the edge work stuff that these guys do to watch how those connect and the other thing we we, we had two sessions with adam francilia so taking the stuff you do off the ice and bring it on the ice with bands and different resistance methods uh of skating um really adam mic'd up explaining why explaining the muscles you need to fire explaining why this work is important a lot of great stuff there that we're going to bring to you and i and i think we'd be remiss because we go get so excited about all the time we spend with all these goalies, uh, we 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 can't forget the guys that make it possible. Obviously, Adam Francilia and Ray Petkow from Alpha Sports Agency, who uh, in not only developed this camp a decade ago. Today was this this was year ten That's this right. year, um, so ten year anniversary. They started this, and not just for what they have built, but for allowing us behind the scenes, behind closed doors, in the meetings. Um, with video cameras on the ice to capture all these conversations. It's, uh, it's an honor. It's a great learning experience. And as Hutch said, over the next couple of months, there is 14 hours of video a day on average that we end up having to pull out of there. If you think about four cameras running an hour and a half each time, plus the off-ice stuff that we do, there is a lot of video on a daily basis, a lot of different microphones, a lot of different cameras that have to all be tied together and produced. So it takes a while, but we've got some fun stuff that'll start coming out this week. And uh, we can't wait to bring it exclusively to our in goal premium members, as well as, like I said, new pro reads with Lorraine Bossois starting this That's week. a lot of SD cards. Some some giant ones. Hutch, is, Hutch has a fancy hard drive. new camera now Straight with the hard, hard drive. drive. Yeah. There's yeah, so much data. Cool there. awesome. Yeah, there's we so much data. You can't do it on an SD card. We big time. I saw those files, 318 gigabytes on one one recording session. I was like, yeah, I don't have an SD card that big. <laughs> I got a pile of them. The not not one that big, but a pile that might make that big. But they're then I get them all mixed up. And you guys are so good at organizing. If you tape them together, yeah. it doesn't work. I tried <laughs> the um, Cam Matt with. Uh, we've got a gear segment coming up over at the Hockey Shop Source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Uh, I want to get to that with the Bauer Hyperlight Chesty in a bit. But you mentioned. Uh, Lauren Brassois, a couple of worlds colliding with news uh, and the Net 360 camp uh, LB with his day with the Stanley Cup that uh, that you guys were at and uh, Martin Jones signing with the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, which happened in the midst of Net 360. So uh, we should touch on both of those uh, happenings, given that you guys were intimately involved. Uh, Let's start with you, Hutch, with uh, following the Martin Jones situation. Yeah, it's it's always interesting because uh, we, we get a little glimpse inside the world of an NHL player agent too, because as Woody mentioned, Ray Petkow uh, is one of the driving forces behind this and, and the agency happens to represent Martin Jones. So uh, we actually tried to get Ray and Adam to come and join us for another great rip in the outback on the side-by-sides. And one of them had to, there's another name that wasn't mentioned by the way, Woody Capo Kakinen was on the ice uh, for all these sessions. I did mention him. You just weren't listening to me because I talked too much. I tune you out a lot. Um, and Adam couldn't join us because he was out for dinner with Capo that night. And Ray couldn't join us because he had a couple of hot deals in the works. And one of them was Martin Jones, and he wouldn't spill the beans what the team was. But we did know that there was a signing imminent. And then the morning of, we found out that the contract had just been delivered and signed uh, there at the camp, which is pretty cool. Literally minutes before we got on the ice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Really exciting. And 
in news that's probably not quite as hot because he's not yet an NHL player, we did see a signing from Beck Warm, who is one of the American League goaltenders, uh, is going to be in the San Jose system this year. So really exciting for him as well. So uh, just some some great, great opportunity to to learn from all of these guys and be a little part of what's happening. And we're excited to be able to bring some of that to everybody. Should mention. As we shout out everyone, James Wendland for the time off the ice, Adam and Ray for making us a part of this, all the coaches and all the goalies. You mentioned the side-by-sides. Shout out to Corey Davidson from oh, yeah. Polaris. Oh, yeah. For every summer taking us out into the backwoods. We got almost to 6,000 feet of elevation uh, in the Polaris side-by-sides. Ripping around the Okanagan in those things is an absolute hoot. And Corey is one of the great guys, member of the goalie union. The goalie union loves him. I think Mike Smith is taking delivery of a new unit pretty soon. Now that he's retired, he can rip around in the countryside on those things with his family. Um, Corey, Corey reached out to us a couple of years ago, reached out to me a couple of years ago and invited us out. And now that's a staple of net 360 for us and, and bringing guests along with us is, to get to experience that and those incredible machines, what an absolute. Uh, on the subject of great rides, so Lauren Brassois this year, uh, going from uh, the hip surgery to the American Hockey League to the National Hockey League and starting the Stanley Cup playoffs and getting through uh, that uh, wonderful first round against Winnipeg where he was so dynamic. Uh, he was up there uh, after his day with the Cup that, uh, that you guys were at. Uh, Woody, uh, you were front and center. Well, because I was covering it for NHL.com because uh, whenever we have a local person for one of these days of the cups. And I've covered a few of them over the years, including a trip over to the Island Port McNeil for Willie Mitchell a number of years back. And, and it's, man, it never gets old, Darren. I know you've lifted it as part of the Vegas franchise after a win, uh, but just being around it and seeing the effect that the cup has on people and good on the rim Um, These guys have a limited amount of time with it. And, and a couple of days later, uh, Aiden Hill, um, and Logan Thompson did the same thing in Calgary, making sure that it got back to the community rinks where they grew up. And in Lorenz's case, the, the rink was so small in Cloverdale that they actually brought it out to the Stetson Bowl. And obviously, most people like the Stetson what? The Stetson Bowl. Grand Sands on two sides. It is the home of the Cloverdale Rodeo. So LB grew up playing in Cloverdale minor hockey. And I think the thing that Cloverdale is most famous for is its annual rodeo. And so what better way to celebrate your day with the cup than, than at the main rodeo grounds. And so he brought it into the Stetson Bowl and he didn't just bring it in. He brought it in on a fire truck from 19. Oh, and I put this in the story and I'm, I think it was 20 or wow. 21. And that 1921 fire truck doesn't quite get around like it used to. So it's on a trailer being towed by a 1980 international. So a couple of classic vintage fire trucks, LB, his fiance, Taryn, uh, Lyndon San Martino, his, the goalie coach, who is, his goalie coach is also now his brother-in-law, um, all on the fire truck, his wife, family, as they come in. And there was a great uh, Kwantlen First Nation welcomed them um, with, with a prayer song and drums. And LB, short and sweet with the speech, but some moments of comedy within there. Like, you know, the thing to do, we talked about this, where would we bring it to if we won the cup? Like, bringing it back to your roots. Is is kind of uh, like like where you played minor hockey. That happens a lot. But in LB's speech, you realize you realized how much connection he still has there, right? Like he's getting married next month, and two of his groomsmen are guys that he played minor hockey with in Cloverdale, right? So the connection to community, the connections that we make in minor hockey, like they they stay. And so to sort of hear him talk about that, as brief as his speech was, it was really well done. And he's like, hey, I'm keeping this short because I want as many of them. It was about probably up to 400 people. Um, they tried to keep it small, but he wanted to make sure he could sign autographs and get pictures with the cup with as many of those people as he could. And it was a blazing hot day and he had other parties to get to. Um, but he made sure he stuck around. He told me afterwards they got right down to the last last person. They got everyone signed pictures. Nobody went home without getting a chance to, to get what they came for, a picture with that magical trophy. Uh, then it was off to a private party in North Vancouver where him and, and his fiance just bought a place smartly, smartly, wisely invited all the neighbors over for, for a, a quick viewing and an introduction so that he wouldn't be the new neighbor that, you know, introduced himself by having a shaker. Um, and then he had the private party. And what better way for a guy who was born on Vancouver Island but raised in the Vancouver suburbs to have a private party with a cup? Like, what, who would you have cater it? 
How about the Taco Fino truck? The famous here in Vancouver Taco Fino food truck in the driveway all night for anybody that wanted tacos. And if you've ever been, we talk about my trips to Tofino to serve. Like Taco Fino started there and it is a staple for West Coasters. So we had the Taco Fino truck uh, on, uh, at his driveway serving his guests. And I got to say, funny story, not told to me by him, but by someone else in the family is when they first called to see if the truck was available, he was told, I'm sorry, the truck is rented out that night. We can't do anything about it. And in case of cancellation, can you leave a name? Well, they left the name. And I think somebody in charge or involved with Taco Fino saw that name on the wait list and was like, hold on, did anybody bother to ask what this was for? Called back. Uh, what's this for? Oh, Stanley Cup party. Yeah, truck's yours for the night. No charge. Really? So yeah, they had they had a great. It sounds like they just had an absolutely great time too with it. So uh, all the guests, because we know some of the guests that were there, uh, Ray and Adam, who are obviously a big part of of their of, of LB's story. Uh, he's trained with Adam for years. Ray is his agent. They both uh, drove down. I think they were going to fly. They ended up driving down from Kelowna on Sunday, spent some time with the cup that evening, and then drove back up to continue getting organized for day one of Net Three Hundred and Sixty. And we start early at Net Three Hundred and Sixty. We're at the rink at eight a.m. Uh, well, actually, we were at the rink before then, but everybody's at the rink by 8 a.m. And Adam's wife, Kathy, does a fantastic job of keeping us. She's a nutritionist, um, keeping everybody fed, but in a healthy manner. So all natural ingredients, shakes to start the morning, snacks in between lunch. And yeah, they all had their day with the cup and managed to get back up in time. That trophy has incredible influence. The powers inside that <laughs> trophy are, are wild. Hutch. Speaking of the power inside that trophy, um, I think a lot of people know that it's a bit of a superstition that you don't touch the cup if you hope to still win it one day. And uh, Darren, I'm sorry that you think maybe your dream has died and you went and touched it, though I guess it's your organization, organization yeah, so it's I, totally different. I, I, yeah, I'm right? So, so there. you're there. You won that. Forgive me, but I maybe thought that you still had... Thoughts that you'd end up between the pipes for a Stanley Cup final game. I, I think you can do it. But um, but speaking of that, uh, Lyndon San Martino, who is a uh, an excellent coach with the uh, Victoria Royals in the Western Hockey League. Um, his name has come up, I know, in a number of professional jobs and, and still hopes that he's going to win that uh, that cup one day. And I and I think he's probably got a great chance of doing that. So he didn't touch the trophy. He said it took all his willpower not to touch the trophy as he was taking those photos, as I think uh, a lot of young goaltenders would feel the same way. Um, so that was one cool thing. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned is that on Tuesday, when LB went on the ice, that was his first time skating since the injury in the playoffs. And you might think, I wonder how this is going to go. He's probably going to take it nice and easy. He was going hard. And Lyndon came over to me and said, man, it doesn't look like he's missed a beat. So Winnipeg fans, he's ready. Great to hear. Yeah, as a matter of fact, he stayed on. He stayed on late. On, late on day two on Wednesday, he stayed out late and took uh, shootout drills with Tyler Myers. I'm not sure the training staff was. They, the, Afran was like, "What's he doing? Why is he taking breakaways on his second day <laughs> off? The, back on the ice after all that time off." But it was like the whole thing was just just pretty cool. Pretty cool to be a part of. Pretty cool to see. Um, from that day with the cup, like I said, covering it and and getting to see the reaction people have to it. And I got to say, Darren. You will notice something in the photos that from Lorenz's party or from his day with the cop, and I'm wondering if it's still the same. I haven't checked the photos of Aiden Hill and Logan Thompson the next day. And by the way, shout out to those guys for also doing a great job. They combined their days so they could spend more time at the community rink and still each have a lot of time as individuals with the cop. And Aiden Hill took it everywhere. I got a buddy whose son plays baseball on a minor pro team in Alberta that ended up drinking from the cup because Aiden, Aiden brought it to the Okotoks. Dogs. The I don't dogs. even know their last name. The Okotok dog. He's an Okotok dog. And so he drank from the cup because Aiden brought it to the ballpark. He took it everywhere. Um, but, but at least by Brossois' party, the cup was not being grabbed by the top of the bowl. Somebody boo-booed it before it got there. And so that bowl was a little loose at the top. So you had to, if you watch all the guys grabbing it, they've got it by the base like you would normally see, but they are not holding it by the top of the bowl. They're sort of holding it by the neck, like you almost like you would hold a yeah. hockey stick, but just a thicker grip rather than by the bowl. Cause 
I don't know who had it right before LB. I don't know how long. We don't want to name names. It might have been a couple days before. This may have been going on for a while, but she was damaged. The cup, the tuck, the cup needs a little repair, a little uh, TLC back home at uh, once everybody's done with it to make sure that. I think there's a, a regular service program with the Stanley Cup that 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 occurs. Yeah, something tells me yeah. it's a frequent occurrence. It Tampa yeah. last year that uh, dented it on, on like the first couple of days. Their big dent in it and had to be be hammered out. So yeah. It, uh, well, who who dented it in the celebration? Someone slid right. into it on the ice post game. Was that was that Tampa the, yeah. the year? Before? So it's it's over. It's, Crazy. It's actually amazing that that thing's still repairable uh, along the way. Uh, which you need a great pro shop to be able to do that. Which you have at the hockey shop, source for sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Everybody's buzzing right now uh, as we gear up towards uh, training camps. Uh, Starting to get to to that uh, magical point where you're looking at dates and you're planning your your trip to to get to the team and the organization uh, that you're going to and uh, an ice session. So uh, that's all coming up as they put everything together and you get a chance to visit with Cam with the Power Hyperlight Chesty. Yeah, no, um, the Hyperlight Chesty. We'll get into that in a sec, but first I got to say, like you name it, it's there. Everything is in stock right now. Uh, we can't keep up with these reviews with all the new stuff that's in store right now. So make sure you check them out. If you happen to be lucky enough to be in the lower mainland or you're coming here for a goalie camp, it's worth the stop. Get out to the hockey shop, check out everything, all the new stuff, all the new stuff from Bauer, all the new stuff from CCM. Uh, They've got the new True line from overseas. I believe it's 7X3. We haven't even had a chance to review that because we can't keep up with all the new stuff that's coming in store at the Hockey Shop. So be sure to check them out in person or online at thehockeyshop.com to find out what's new, uh, what's in store. Just given the sheer size of the place, if it's available, they're going to have inventory. Chances are they're going to have plenty of it. Uh, they got some great new graphics on some Brian's pads uh, that we saw on the wall again that we haven't had a chance to get to to do a full review on. Uh, they got the new CCM Eflex 6 chest protector that we talked about last week. Some guys were trying that out with us that, that loved it. Uh, new CCM Eflex 6 skates, like just lots of stuff all at the hockey shop, all at the hockey shop.com. And just because we didn't get to everything or we're still in the process of getting to a lot of this stuff doesn't mean it's not available. Doesn't mean it's not perfect to help you become a better goaltender. The people to ask about whether it suits your game, suits your style, fits the way you want to play, the way you envision yourself playing, the way you want your gear to feel on your body. No better people to ask than Cam and his crew at the Hockey Shop or thehockeyshop.com. So if you've got any questions about the latest and greatest, we haven't answered it yet in our video reviews because we haven't had time to keep up with so many new arrivals. Make sure you just ask them in person. Um, Check them out at thehockeyshop.com. And Cam, at the end of this Hyperlate review, will give you the numbers to call. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source of Sports. I'm here with Cam Matwiv. We are at the Hockey Shop. 34,000 square feet of hockey greatness. And in our little corner of the world, goalie utopia, surrounded by literally like floor-to-ceiling goaltending goodness. Skates, chest protectors, gloves, blockers, pants, helmets, sticks. But today we are focused. Oh, focus, focus. Back on the rail. Focused on the Hyperlite 2 chest from Bauer. Thank you. Brand new for this year. I know it's easy to get distracted down here, so we'll get things back. So, Hyperlite 2 chest. Yes, you're wearing it right now. How does it feel? Good, actually. Yeah, no, again, you know, uh, right off the wall, uh, you haven't done any break in on this unless like you did aerobics in it that I didn't see at some <laughs> no, point. Not at all. I could picture, you know, like Richard Simmons outfit with this on. Anyways, um, I don't think anybody wants to picture that. It works good. So overall, as you've now had it on for a quick second, so Bauer is wanting to build off of the success of the original Hyperlite chest protector itself. Um, lightweight. Lightweight, lightweight, lightweight. This is the lightest unit on the wall in a Pro Series chest right now. Um, overall, feel-wise, it, it feels kind of like you're wearing a T-shirt, almost. Don't have T-shirts that are quite this bulky, but we'll, we'll go hoodie for you. No, we'll okay. go hoodie. Fine. Bul- bulky hoodie-ish. But you it's still have supreme mobility to it as well. So with that weight being shaved down, again, we're creating uh, you know, good mobility to the chest, good movability. We're not... 
sacrificing overall protection though for the unit itself. Um, redesign the shoulder floaters and the way the shoulder system works itself. You can see like this plate, for example, in through the breast plate here, actually flexes inwards as you move, so as you're coming to go seal. Because we always get, you know, I was talking about I did the hat, and I was doing the old glove, blocker stay. Yes. So well, you really, want to go out and hug someone. Hug your best goalie buddy out there. Take that, you know, that shot off the chest, drop it into the glove. You got to be able to do this. So that shock plate as well in the middle, keeping up with that as well, has also been redesigned to create more of an absorption effect to that puck as well. So we're not hammering out rebounds out to the side. Okay. So these floaters are still adjustable. They are held on by Velcro in the back. Arm adjustability itself remains with their uh, tab system as well. So easily movable, but what you also can see now at a custom level itself, interchangeable. So this chest itself can be ordered custom along with the other three units that you see from Bauer as well, including the Pro Series, the Mock, as well as the original Hyperlite. We can start mixing and matching the arms as well as adding a beef up package if you wish, the shoulders, forearm, and biceps. So those are all awesome options that are available for this chest and some of the other ones as well. What else is custom, Cam? Can you do graphics on this? Ah, uh, DigiPrint Custom is also available as well, which you can definitely cover another day. That's no problem there. If you got any questions on how to get your setup and custom options from Bauer, as much as we just, we can't tease them all. There's too many different options. Where do they get a hold of you with those types of questions? Well, here? hold on. What, what, the, ba, 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 ba. You still have the belly extenders as well for the chest. We didn't quite finish the chest, but to quickly round it off, you still have those belly extensions that are removable, so you can adjust that overall length of the body unit itself just to suit your specific needs. Tuck, untuck, what does this fit? Both. Both. Yes. So if you do have some questions about it, you can give me a call 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790 or check us out at thehockeyshop.com. Hyperlite 2 chest. You can't run away with this one. Of all the equipment that you guys are able to sample during your gear segments, the chest is my favorite because you can you can hear you and then once it comes out on on the YouTube page, uh, you can see you doing the whole segment in your chesty, Woody. Yeah, I do like that. I like that cuz I usually like I like playing dress up. Let's be honest. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, going to the hockey shop with Cam or to a Taylor Swift concert, I like to dress up, you know, and and play the role. I do like the chesties in particular because as I flex the arms and test the range of motion, it's always good to pop Cam once in a while when he's not expecting it. So, um, got to keep him in his place. Little slap across the back of the head, only because I'm trying to make sure that that chest protector will fully extend for a good blocker save. I like to keep him on my right. Um, that's my favorite part. Dress up and slap and cam. How much stock do you put into uh, being able to move mobility right off the rack? Or do you allow now still some time to break it in? It's a good question. Um, listen, retail appeal, off the rack appeal, the ability to put it on and feel like you can move in it probably plays a role, right? It's like grabbing a glove off the rack and can you close it? Um, the reality is we know it's going to break in, but the stiffer those things are, the more time that's going to take. And, you know, we're not all, you know, junior hockey players on the ice multiple times a week, um, uh, getting lots of reps and lots of chance to break it in, right? Like some of us are beer leaguers and, you know, right this time of the year to break in a chest. If I'm only on the ice, like once a week at the most, it's a little harder to do. So you might lean that way a little bit. Um, I think what you could take you a year with the number of pucks that hit you, Woody. Uh, well, no, I still have to move to fall out of the way for the pucks to go by me, so it does break in. Uh, and getting up from prone positions actually can be a good way to break in a chest protector. Beer league break in. That'd be a great segment. Oh, that is an awesome <laughs> segment. Beer league break in. Um, <laughs> so I will say the one thing I think I'm looking for is you know, we all we joke about the cup of coffee and checking the ears and stuff. And the reality is, because CCM did a great study on this, like a lot of the stuff we do when we go in stores, kind of like the pad flex thing, like the things we do, like touch the top of our head, you know, in the store. When was the last time you touched the top of your head to make a save? Like, what's the point, right? Like, so the range of motion we want is with our hands out in front of us, right? So we should really, what's the one thing to do? I would advise to go there to make sure when you're doing these little exercises, if it matters to you, you actually use a range of motion. Um, a lot of guys reach their hands around. Well, one of the biggest tests is 
will that chest protector allow you to fold your hands in front of you like you're making a cradle save, right? Because if we're playing well, we're getting hit in the chest. We don't want those popping out in the middle. We want to pull them off. So do the arms, is there any restriction on sort of getting your hands out in front of you, even whether it's to catch a puck in front of you or to cradle a puck off your chest? Those are the types of things you should be doing. What I'm looking for is sometimes you'll get a unit where the elbow mechanism will catch on something on the bicep. And it's not that it's, it's not a break in. It's an actual, there's a, there's a, there's a design thing there where it will catch and restrict it and prevent that movement. Those are probably the things I'm looking for more, more than, Hey, is it stiff here? And is it going to take longer to break in? Is there anything that actually becomes a blockage or prevents me from making the full range of motion that is required to make a save? Here's an idea. Put on the new chesty, whatever brand it is. In this case, uh, we're talking about the Bauer Hyperlight. And see if you can put on the Sensorina headset, the Oculus headset, and go down the path of uh, of Sensorina, Sensorina VR Hotch. It's actually a really mm-hmm. good idea, Darren. That's an excellent idea. Stores should have a station set up with a net, and you can actually go in there and make some saves in the gear. I think that's a uh, boom. Things that because why didn't we think of it before? Of things you, yeah, you can all sign kinds of things that you can do with Sensorina, right? No, for sure. And uh, I think that's just a great way to go. If you want to get ready for the season, you're going to go to the hockey shop and you're going to find just the right gear and then maybe put on your Sensorina to make sure that you've got just the right set. Not only will Sensorina help you uh, decide if you're set up properly for the season, but it will actually help you get ready for the season mentally. One of the things that's come up in a lot of our discussions on the ice with goaltenders and coaches at places like net 360 is hockey iq or goalie iq really comes up pro reads a great way to develop it another great way is sensorina because you can get in there with nhl shooters doing drills designed by nhl coaches by nhl goaltenders um you can face power play scenarios you can um look at all the different kind of drills that you might do on the ice with a coach as well and just Get a chance to read what shooters are doing, read what's happening in plays. You can even go and do some mental training stuff with the neurocognitive drills. You can improve your goalie IQ by working with Sensorina today. And uh, now's a great time to do it because you're heading into your season. Tryouts are just around the corner if they haven't started already. Um, Hop on Sensorina. If you've got an Oculus right now, go grab it. You can try their seven-day free trial. See what Sensorina is all about. A chance to do it this week. Put it on your list if you have an Oculus at home. If you don't, they've got a great deal on because their pro version where you get the full meal deal, everything you'd like to do in Sense Arena is now available for only 29 bucks a month. Think about that. That's about three months, four months for the price of one session with a private goalie coach. But you get it as much as you want every month, all year long. Great way to become a better goaltender, as we know so many great goaltenders are doing today. So go grab Sensorina, check it out today, sensorina.com. If you're going to do it, use the code IGM50, and Woody can't help himself. He's going to let us know something else. Well, NHL shooters, we've talked about NHL shooters being a part of the Sensorina environment. How about NHL sponsorship? Sensorina now partnering with the National Hockey League announced it while we were up at Net360. Um, certainly jumped out to me. So we know they've been working directly with teams, teams that use their product. They've got sponsorship deals in place with a handful of NHL teams. Well, how now the entire league? So there's a lot of great things coming. If if you ever, like, if you want to take your visualization to the next level, you want to be in NHL uniforms, in NHL arenas, um, really put yourself in the shoes of a National Hockey League or in the skates, I guess, of a National Hockey League goaltender. It sounds like those opportunities are coming as part of this partnership between Sensorine and the National Hockey League. And hey, listen, it's one thing to have a sponsorship partnership. Uh, but as we know from our experience, this is legitimately a tool used by NHL goaltenders to get better on a game day to warm up. There are guys, some of the best in the business that are using this tool. So, um, you know, it's a tie in that goes beyond just a partnership and a sponsorship. Uh, it's a time that's legit because you can face NHL shooters right now. Uh, you could before the partnership was announced. And we've got NHL goaltenders we know that use it on a regular basis. So um, if you're looking for it, not that we need any anything to legitimize Sense Arena in our eyes. We've been talking about it for years and how valuable it is as a tool. Uh, but one more level of affirmation for the product. 
from the National Hockey League. Another step in the evolution of Sensorina, Sensorina VR, as we get into our feature interview this week, which involves a, a great journey by a Luongo. And this is the first time we've had brothers uh, on the podcast. Uh, Roberto's been part of the podcast a couple of times. And now Leo Luongo is going to uh, join Kevin Woodley. It's correct, right? The first time we've had brothers? I, I was I was doing a little thinking. We're 220 plus episodes in. So I thought for a second, I thought there must have been a point along the way. Did we have both of Berger's kids on? No, I think we've only had one. I think you're right. I think you're right, Darren. I think you're right. This is our first brother. Hutch, Hutch is my like real fact checker when he gets that quizzical look in him. And I haven't seen it yet. So uh, I, I'm fairly confident. I was just impressed Woody pulled out the Broder family. Well, yeah, I was, I'm going through my so. mind. The other one, of course, would be the Alaires, who we're going to hear Leo reference. And of course, who Roberto referenced in his two times on the podcast. But Benny Alaire is a little, you know, sort of little media shy. They don't like him doing the media. Or he doesn't. He's not a big. Well, he's great to talk to. He talks to us, you know, whenever he was in town, but he doesn't do these types of things. So we've had Francois on, but not Benoit. And yeah, I'm, I don't think we've had any other brothers. So yeah, this is a first. We're breaking new ground. And listen, Leo Luongo is on our podcast because Leo Luongo is a great goaltending coach, not because he's Roberto Luongo's brother. And you'll hear it in the interview. He references his experiences with his brother a few times, but the interview really, you know, um, not intentionally, it wasn't really about his brother. And interestingly enough, we talked about it a little bit afterwards. And I actually wish I was still recording because his answer was so good. He talked about how, listen, like he's, He's not naive. He knows that being Roberto Luongo's little brother has opened doors to opportunities for him in the past. Um, you know, the chance to meet and work with Ian Clark, uh, the chance to start in the QMJHL, his first time as a goalie coach. But as we know, getting an opportunity and making the most of the opportunity, like if you're not, if you can't do the job, they're not keeping you in the job. I don't care what your last name is. And so seeing Leo's path. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to have him on is I kept, you know, it was it was yet the latest example in the playoffs this year, right? Um, Florida needs a goalie. A guy who spent most of the year with him in the American Hockey League gets called up and has a ton of success. And it's a story we've seen before. And some names that, you know, maybe not everyone will remember, but, you know, whether it's Ray Tober, uh, um, other guys in the past that have been down there in so many different styles. And so I just thought it was a great opportunity to, to have a conversation with a guy I always enjoy talking to. He's been long overdue to be on the podcast. Uh, and there's so much in this journey. Make sure you stick with us, folks. The first answer is a long one. He puts me to shame with this one. Walks us through his entire sort of coaching history in the first answer. And then we go back and pick through spots. So there are so many great takeaways in this one for coaches and for goalies. Um, out of his path from Roberto's little brother to... QMJHL to coaching in Switzerland to now a part of the Florida Panthers. He's been, this is his 16th year coming up as a professional goaltending coach. And there's lots of lessons along the way that he shares with us. It's the feature interview on in goal radio, the podcast brought to you by Sensorina, Sensorina VR. Really excited to welcome to the Ingle Radio Podcast. First time guest, but a guy that I've had the pleasure of talking to for, for a number of years now. And every time I do, I learn something and enjoy the conversation. And I know our audience will too. Uh, 15 years as a goalie coach, coming up on year 16, currently with the Florida Panthers goaltending program of excellence, the, the aptly named, uh, working with the Charlotte Checkers and as a development coach for the Florida Panthers, Leo Luongo. Thank you very much for uh, for making the time for us here on the Ingle Radio Podcast. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. I've been a big fan of the podcast for a long time, so it's uh, it's an honor to be on. I've been a big fan too because every time it seems, especially since you've come over, obviously there was some time over in Lugano since you've come back and worked with the Florida organization. I'm looking at the names and 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 all all I all I see are guys who come up from first Springfield and then Charlotte, ready to play in the National Hockey League and have success. I think of the Chris Dreegers of the world, um, Harry Sateri, Rito Berra, uh, Sam Montembeau. Like Every time it seems like the Panthers need to reach down to the farm, they've got a goalie who's ready to play, and you're the goalie coach responsible for that. So I wanted to pick your brain, get, get some, you know, some ideas on, on sort of how your philosophy has, has molded over the years. But first, let's, let's dig into the background and 
playing days, transition to coaching. Uh, how did Leo Luongo fall in love with the position? Well, um, I mean, it's not as glorious as, uh, as uh, my brother's uh, past. Um, but uh, it started, honestly, um, when I stopped playing, I was around 17, 18 years old. Um, I was never very big. Um, so I kind of felt like I always had to make up for that. And the way I did that was anytime I did, you know, goalie schools in the summertime, um, I always tried to really pay attention to what the goalie coaches were saying. And, you know, uh, I even had a little notepad and write things down. So uh, I just kept notes of everything. Um, it was just always something that I, I, you know, I tried to get an edge uh, um, on other guys, you know, and that's, I didn't have the size. So I tried to, you know, I tried to make my brain uh, be the edge on other guys. So, um, so I started, uh, I always had an interest for, for, for the coaching part. So when I, um, I stopped playing, I took a little break from hockey for about a year or two. And then a minor uh, hockey league coach reached out to me and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in uh, uh, working with the goalies on his team. It was uh, Pee Wee level, I believe. So it was about uh, 10 to 12 years old or sorry, 12 to 14 years old. So I started working with them and, you know, uh, you, you start hanging around the rinks and all of a sudden, you know, this team needs a goalie coach and that team needs a goalie coach. So you start helping out with a few more teams. And uh, so I was doing that for a little while, doing some summer camps with the with, uh, with, uh, guys around Montreal, uh, just helping out. And then uh, while my brother was working for the Vancouver, uh, sorry, while he was playing for the uh, Vancouver Canucks, I went over during the year to, to, to watch him play and uh, he introduced me to Ian Clark. And so um, I started talking to, to Clarky and we got to know each other. And he, he asked me, um, if I would be interested in starting up a branch of his GDI company in Quebec, um, if I, it's something I'd be interested in. So uh, obviously, you know, you know, as well as I do, uh, how, how Clark he is. And uh, so, you know, you start talking hockey with him, uh, you can talk for hours. So um, I was extremely interested and also because I get to work with Clarky and, and learn a lot. So I started uh, working, uh, doing GDI Quebec. And, um, you know, with that, I started doing camps for Clarkie, uh, or with Clarkie, I should say, in Shaddix. Uh, I did one in Calgary. And, uh, you know, you, there's always open line of communication. So you start talking about uh, going to, you know, uh, symposiums and stuff like that. And uh, you meet other goalie coaches. So learned a lot, a ton from Clarkie, um, for sure. And that kind of started, you know, create the first few steps for me to start moving forward in my career. So once I, you know, got to meet Clarkey and do some of the GDI camps and meet other goalie coaches and through my brother, I also knew Francois Allaire. So started doing summer camps for him and then pro camps. And then uh, all that led to, to a job in Bathurst in the Quebec league. I was there for five years. I was kind of juggling a couple of things at that time, um, you know, uh, in the Quebec at the time, at least, Goalie coaches weren't really paid that well in the Quebec League, but I did it for the experience. I did it for the, obviously, um, to improve as a goalie coach. So I was, you know, juggling that job. I was also working at Air Canada at the time to kind of be able to afford a cheap flight to fly out to Bathurst and be there for a few weeks at a time. So I was doing that for four or five years. Um, it allowed me to also get in with Hockey Canada and do development camps, which is where I met Franz Jean. And he was another big part of, uh, of, of kind of molding me. And, and uh, through him, you know, I started working with him at his camps. And so that's how, the way it went for me for the first four or five years in Bathurst. And then after my five years in Bathurst, I, was, I felt like I, I needed a change. You know, it's, it had been five years I was with that team. And it's a small market team. And I just needed a change of scenery. And um, I actually had a little bit of, um, a little bit of time uh it was it was it was during the lockout year 2012 that was my last year in Bathurst and uh um when the NHL started up again I think in January it was uh Franz uh reached out to me and said look we need a guy in Syracuse um you know just for to finish half the season uh it would be just volunteer coaching you can you can go you know a couple days a month whatever and uh obviously I I jumped on the opportunity even though there was no money involved it's just for the experience of it um, so then I started juggling three jobs. <laughs> so the Air Canada one, I had the Bathurst one, and I had the uh, Syracuse one. 
So, but it was a great experience. I got to work closely with Franz and I got, you know, to work with uh, that whole coaching staff there. I ended up in the NHL, uh, John Cooper, um, Rob Zettler, um, you know, all the, all the players that were there, uh, uh, Tyler Johnson, all that, and so on and so forth. So, um, so it was a great experience for me. And then at the same time, while I was there, I got an offer to, to go to Switzerland. And, um, there was no guarantees while, while I was in Syracuse that I'd be uh, offered a contract for the next year. And uh, after speaking with Franz, and there were some changes within that organization at the time. He said, look, you get a chance to go to Switzerland and then see a different brand of hockey, run your own show. Um, so, he, you know, he advised me, he said, if I were you, I would go, but it's your, totally your decision. So um, I, I, uh, I, I went with my, uh, was my fiance at the time. We went to, 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 to Lugano, you know, watched, uh, saw like what the, their setup and, and uh, what the job entailed. And it entailed for me not only to work with the pro guys, but the entire minor league system there. So I'd kind of be... Uh, in charge of all that, which was uh, a pretty awesome opportunity. Um, yeah. So I took it. I took it and I don't regret it for a second. I mean, uh, uh, I, I learned so much going over there. You know, sometimes you kind of get in that bubble of North American hockey and think like, you know, yeah. every, every, all the smartest people are here, but the development process over there, you know, for the number of hockey players they have to be able to produce, you know, players in the NHL, goalies in the NHL, it, it's pretty amazing. And, uh, I met a lot of different people there. Got to do camps in Sweden and Italy, and again learned a lot. Um, you learn different things, and and kind of I think that's that's part of being a good coach. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like a, I, it's also the same thing for a goalie, I should say, um, because uh, ultimately you're always trying to evolve. You're not yeah. you don't want to be stuck in your ways. So um, yeah, so so I learned a lot and. Uh, after a couple of years there, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I got to work uh, with Elvis Merzlikens, um, that's that ended up in Columbus there. Uh, yep. It was his first few years. He was still, when I got there, he was a junior. He had just been passed over in the draft. Um, so, you know, the, the, the GM there told me this kid has a ton of talent, but, you know, he's, uh, <laughs> he's a little crazy. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess one of my strengths is I get along with everybody. So I kind of, you know, we built a relationship and he trusted me. And, uh, you know, when you have that, then the sky's the limit. So right. um, we started to build and, and, and kind of obviously his strength is an incredible athlete. And, uh, but we kind of tried to bring some structure to it. And then uh, obviously after I left, uh, Mike Lawrence uh, joined the team and he kind of continued that and, and uh, made him uh, the goal he is today. And so, um, but it was a great opportunity, like I said, to work with, uh, to work in Europe and to work with Elvis. I had another goalie over there, Daniel Manzaro, who was also awesome to work with. And so we, we, you know, we, we ended up uh, getting to the final. It was the first time in 10 years that team hadn't won a round. So we got to the final in my last year there. And then uh, that summer, my third year, um, after my third year in Lugano, I had an opportunity uh, to come over, to come back to North America. I had a few, uh, interviews with a few different teams for the AHL job. And uh, I, after speaking with my wife and, and the opportunities I had, um, you know, the one that made most sense for me was with Florida, just because uh, Springfield was close to Montreal, which is our home base. And, uh, um, you know, and, and they had offered me uh, three years. So just for stability reasons, my wife was pregnant at the time. So, um, so we decided to take that. And uh, again, I mean, I get to work with uh, Rob Tallis and, and my brother was still playing at the time and get, get to be in the same organization as him. It was pretty special. Um, and then that's it. I've, I've been there. I was in Springfield four years. The team re relocated to Charlotte. So I've been uh, this, I'm going to be going on my eighth year. Uh, again, you know, I think that's uh, another important piece is that um, of being a good college coach is not only, uh, you know, to continue to learn from other coaches and goalies, but also to continue to learn from head coaches as well. And I got to work with uh, Jordy Kinnear, who's still in Charlotte. And uh, he's played with Marty Brodeur. And he um, was awesome. It's awesome to pick his brain. And we kind of work really well together, which I think is a big part of the, the reason why uh, a lot of the goalies I've had, I've been able to jump up to the NHL and have success. It's just, there's just a trust there. And I think it's a big part of, uh, you know, a big part of having success is that relationship with your head coach. So, uh, he's, he's a major part of that. And um, yeah, that's it. So that's it for me right now. Uh, obviously, in the last few years, 
with my brother retiring and, and kind of jumping into management, he brought in the, um, the goalie department. Uh, he added the excellence part, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, so he was part of it. So he had to add, he had to add the excellence part. Um, so, uh, that's also been awesome. Awesome part. Uh, I've, you know, you always did some scouting, but, um, doing this level of scouting, uh, it's, it's a passion I didn't know I had. And, uh, you know, it's been great. Like you get to meet the, and talk about guys and, and, and brainstorm and, and uh, you get to learn as a coach as well by, by watching so much, so much of the, the younger generation coming in and what they're doing and the new things they're bringing in. So I, I feel like there's uh, we've gone through the whole career as a coach here in the span of 12 minutes. There's about I've been making yeah. notes notes as we go here. I've got about a million different threads I want to pull on and ask you about. But let me rewind it a bit because um, you talked about the names that you got to, you know, mentor under and work with and learn from Alaire, Ian Clark, who I, I got to be honest, I didn't realize there was a GDI connection. So like small world, the guy who brought me into goaltending uh, as as a writer, I, I didn't even know that that you had had worked with him at that level. And then Franz, what about before? You talked about the notebook, this notebook you made working with goalie coaches. Were there, was there anyone in particular that had an impact as you're making these notes, as you're trying to overcome, a, like, as you said, a lack of size by being better technically? Are there some names from the past there? Are there, are there, are there times, do you still have the notebook and go back to it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I didn't really. I was young at the time, so I didn't really pay attention. Uh, I was also doing summer camps at Francois Lair, so you know, some of that was him. And and yeah. uh, um, if if you go back to my brother's Hall of Fame speech, uh, he, he does mention a goalie coach, Mario Berry, who kind of worked with him in midget. Um, I used to go to his camps as well. So I kind of you know over the years just wrote different notes. I didn't think I, except for obviously Francois, who was a, at the time was an NHL goalie coach. Uh, um, you know, uh, he's very recognizable. So, but otherwise, uh, I didn't really pay attention to who was coaching me. I just like, it's like, if they said something that interests me, that made sense, that, 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 uh, that'd be like, oh yeah, this, this works. And then this works in this situation and this doesn't work in this situation. So I'd always write these notes and I tend to go back to it sometimes just to, to get a good kick. You know, obviously the, the, the positions changed so much over the years. Um, you know, you're not, you're not doing, uh, uh, two pad jammer uh, drills anymore but uh, <laughs> but um but uh yeah no it's just it's just good sometimes to go back and it kind of keeps you humble uh, you know keeps you humble and and uh it keeps you grounded and uh, i like to go back at it sometimes and just uh, look over the notes and get a good kick of that but i do try to keep a lot of uh of notes uh, and things, uh, you know, after practice or, or even when I was working at, at camps with, with Clarky or with Francois or with Franz, I always kept notes of, of drills and key points and stuff like that. And then I think, you know, you, you, as my brother always used to say, you know, like you, you try things and some things you like and some things you don't like, and you got to pick what works for you. And that kind of, I kind of have that same philosophy for coaching. You know, you, you go work with a lot of different people and some things you like and some things you don't like. And you kind of pick what works for you and what your, you know, your philosophy is. I, I got to uh, come back to the size thing too. Where are we at with that? Because, you know, I don't, it's, it's funny that you mentioned you felt like you had to be better at all the technical stuff. So you dialed in on that. You paid that extra level of attention. I see it today. Undersized goalies that just, they seem to track better. They skate better. They probably because they have to, to survive and keep moving up the levels you know, without giving away any organizational philosophies, like, are we seeing a shift back? Like, like, is it as much as we're probably always going to favor the six, four, six, five guy, are we seeing the six footer and six one get more of a chance now? Or should we be seeing that um, as the game changes and becomes more East West? Well, I mean, for me, the number one thing we always, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of key points we, we always look for, but um we, one of the key points we always look for is if the, the goalie stops direct shots, you know, regardless of size or anything like that. If he, if we're not talking about, you know, deflections and, and things like that, things that are, you know, you against the shooter, does he stop it? And it's, it may seem so simple, but, you know, sometimes guys tend to, tend to get, um, uh, over-focused on size and, and uh, you know, this guy reminds me of Carey Price or you, you kind of, you lose a bit of the, the simplicity. So 
that's one of our main criteria criteria is you know breakaway two on one open shots does he stop the puck so for me uh that has nothing to do with size it's either he stops or not now obviously if you look at numbers wise there are more of the smaller goalies uh starting to creep in at the pro level uh but the numbers still favor the bigger guys at at the at the moment but i think that uh teams are starting to look at it as more of they want athlete you know and so i think that's why you're starting to see the smaller uh goaltender you know uh, smaller goalies getting more of a chance because at times you know bigger guys either take more time to uh, to fill in uh, their bodies and and uh, take more time to adjust whereas a smaller guy you know they, they tend to be a little bit more athletic cuz that's what got them uh to where they are today um so i think yeah there is a, a trend going that way for sure but um right now i think the numbers still favor a little bit more the bigger guy one of the other things you talked about and you mentioned having to work the air canada job and at one point just so you could get cheap flights you know to 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 uh, bathurst for to coach in the queue and at one point working three jobs i don't want to put you on the spot too much cuz so i'll rant on this one a little bit but like it it does bug me at times that the goaltending coach seems to be the lowest paid so i'm working on pushing pushing that envelope higher but is that something that when you're just starting out you have to do like be prepared to sacrifice there's a lot of guys that that i know over the years have you know stories about sleeping at the rink or sleeping in cars or whatever just cuz there isn't you know, there isn't a lot of money at the beginning stages, um, you know, and there are some teams that pretty much expect you to do it for the track suit, for lack of a better term. Is that just part of the battle or are we getting to the point where maybe hopefully we can shift that so, you know, guys can actually focus on the job? Well, I think, you know, for me, my situation at the time when I did that, I was very young. I didn't have a family or anything like that. Um, right. In fact, I actually graduated in uh in uh, computer science. So uh, I was actually working a nine to five job and doing the, uh, doing the, uh, the coaching uh, volunteer, like I said earlier on. Um, and then when the GDI thing came up, I, I kind of started to do that full time. Um, but, you know, there, there is some form of sacrifice, I think at the beginning, um, it, just because of it is what it is. Like you said, uh, you know, goalie coaches tend to be on the, lower scale of 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 uh of being paid and so uh i think there is however a a change coming i mean it, as you can see a lot more nhl teams nowadays are are developing uh, a program where you're having two three goalie coaches a director you know a, a scout uh, a goalie coach for your nhl team a goalie coach for your american league team i'd like to see it where there's also a goalie coach in the east coast team because uh, you know a full time because um, yeah. as you can see, a lot of times guys' prospects come out of college or, or uh, junior and, um, you know, sometimes there's no room in the American League team right away and, and or sometimes they need a little bit more time to develop in the East Coast. And, you know, some of the NHL goalies uh, like Jonathan Quick, James Reimer, they play in the East Coast League. So um, uh, Chris Dreger and I used to always talk about how the East Coast is a jungle, you know, guys are left to fed for themselves. So it's, uh, it's not always easy. Um, so I think, uh, to answer your question, I think it's still not where it needs to be, but there have been some strides made, uh, in that department over the years for sure. Yeah, I know. It's amazing how many times I talk to guys that do end up in the ECHL and despite best intentions of a development coach, it's just, there's only so much of you to go around, right? Like it's hard to get down there and that, you know, that might be when they need it the most, right? Just coming out of, just coming out of junior or college. And that's the first step for them to get reps. and you know, again, I've talked to guys in other organizations. I won't name the organizations, but where they just feel like they're left to their own devices to figure it out. And it, I'm with you. It feels like a little bit of a gap that's still left there on the development side. For sure. And, and I get it's a business thing and, and, uh, but ultimately it's an investment, uh, you know, it's an investment in, in, in development and, and like, like I, those names I mentioned before, you know, those guys can be future NHL goalies. Um, so, and as you saw this year too, Sebastian goes to the first rounder was in the East coast. So, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's, there's value, uh, in, in having a goalie coach there. And I think, uh, you know, I, like I said, we're, there are strides being made, but I think there's still a gap there for sure. At least we're seeing the strides. It wasn't that long ago. I remember covering this position and the idea of even having a coach in the American league, um, you know, more teams didn't than did. So it's nice to see this, this swing and hopefully it keeps going that way. You know, speaking of different environments and, and putting the resources in, 
Your thoughts on your time at Lugano, you mentioned working all the way, you know, first time with Elvis, he was a junior. What does that allow you to do? What does that structure help with, um, you know, in terms of a, a, a nation almost trying to build goaltenders when you've got that top down approach where the guy who's working with the top team is also spending time with the kids that are coming up. And I guess maybe more importantly, perhaps, are you spending time not just working with the younger goalies coming up through junior, but other goaltending coaches? Like, is there a structure underneath you whereby you're sharing with the goalies and the coaches? Well, at first I was the only goalie coach. So I, okay. I spent a lot of hours, uh, a lot of, a lot of hours on the ice, on the ice. Sorry. Um, I think I calculated one of the years in one, one week, I think I was close to 70 hours on the ice. Wow. Um, yeah. Just because, you know, you're starting, uh, I would start at uh, 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. on the ice with the guys, with the junior guys that went on the ice before school. Um, they'd get off, and then by the time they're off, you're starting with the pro guys. And then the pro guys get off. I'd have some quick lunch, and then, you know, you, I'd start with the three, four-year-old kids that are learning to skate. You know, I had to help out with that. So, And then all through until the ladies' team was on at, I think, 9 or 10 o'clock. So um, I put in a lot of hours for sure. and it, Again, it was it was tough, but it helped me learn a lot because you're working with, again, like different goalies, a uh, different mentality, a different mindset, and uh, also get work, to work with the youth coaches. And and like I said before, when I talked about Jordy Kinnear, like you get to learn from from the head coaches as well, and then the youth coaches. Um, sometimes it's something minor, but it makes a difference. Uh, and then through you know uh, working with all these guys, I got to meet. Uh, a coach by the name of Mike Andreasen. He's a Swedish goalie coach. Okay. And he brought me over to Sweden to, to run, uh, to help uh, at his uh, goalie mania camps. Uh, and there was all, you know, SHL goalies and SHL goalie coach. And then again, uh, there again, you get to learn from uh, goalies and goalie coaches. So it's always learning. And uh, I think you, you don't want to stay stuck in your ways like I mentioned earlier you want to be always trying to evolve and trying to get better and because ultimately like uh, the game is always evolving and and you have to you have to stay with it you can't just be content with with what you know can you like I mean it's a few like you said the game is always evolving you started in Switzerland in 2013 um, so we're coming up on 10 years ago but do you remember back to something that maybe you picked up in Switzerland or at a Swedish camp that was like, hey, like, you know, a tool in the toolbox. You talked about it earlier with Roberto, how, you know, you try new things. Some work, some don't. Some you keep, some you throw out. Is there something you you brought back from Switzerland or Sweden or that experience or that's still in your teaching repertoire today? Like, you know, an, an example, maybe even of a technical aspect that you thought of differently before you went over that that still remains a part of your coaching toolbox now, because obviously we've got an audience that's all goalies. So they like to dig into the minutiae. Like what what kind of technique did did Leo bring back from Switzerland or Sweden? There's a bunch of stuff, um, but uh, I'll give a, one example. Um, when I was over in Sweden, um, especially uh, it stayed with me uh, my first year that I went there. They had maybe an hour and a half session. I think they went through two drills. So they did two drills for an hour and a half. And it was, wow. a, a, yeah, it was a drill of just, you know, connecting with your post. And, 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 uh, I, I was, I was impressed. I, I was impressed at the fact that the goalie stayed so committed to doing that. And, you know, there's, it would get a little redundant and, and, but they committed and they, they stayed on it. And you could tell at the end of the week, you know, that was a primary focus for most of the week. And, and you know, they never missed their posts. And, uh, and uh, I think that stayed with me. Like the focus, you know, the, you don't want to be a, a jack of all trades, a master of none, you know. So, you, so they, uh, they, uh, they really focused on that one thing and, and that stayed with me. So I kind of brought that with, my, with me as well. Like not to, you know, run practices and try to hit three, four things, you know, maybe focus on, one thing and 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 try to win your day you know and and uh i think the over focus on that one thing it, it allows you to get better instead of trying to do you know trying to hammer in uh three four different things and oftentimes you have 20 30 minutes so um i think that stayed with me and i think it's a big part of how i coach today um i was just gonna ask are you is it 
how hard can it be at times to apply that when you're, you know, you are limited in how much time you have with the goaltenders because you're managing their bodies, you're managing their rest, uh, as well as their practice reps, um, you know, as they're coming up as a development coach, especially in the American Hockey League, like you got to focus on games, you got to focus on, like I said, managing rest as, as well as reps. Have you been able to translate that um, over here? Um, for sure. I mean, you, you, you learn along the way, obviously, the schedule in Switzerland, uh, it's a lot easier yeah. in, in that sense. You know, guys are playing twice a week. They get national team breaks. Um, it's a totally different lifestyle. Um, you know, in the American League, uh, I would say in Springfield, it wasn't too bad. I mean, it, it, it was a heavy schedule for sure. But we tend to have a lot of uh, 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 three and threes and, and games on the weekend. And it wasn't so much during the week. So we would often have long weeks of practice. So it wasn't too bad. Um, in terms of like trying to squeeze in a practice, I, if I did want to do a little bit heavier, uh, depending on how the weekend went, it would always be early in the week and then obviously taper off, uh, as it got closer to games. Um, uh, in Charlotte, it's a little bit different, you know, we're, we're uh, we're located f- further from every other team. So, uh, we tend to, you know, play midweek games and then fly for two weeks, uh, you know, and hit a couple of teams on the road and, and not have a ton of practice time. So, the schedule is managed a little bit differently there. Um, and the NHL is a whole different ball game, obviously, you know, with, right. with the 82 right. schedule, you're playing every other night. So it's different. Um, I, I, that's why I think it's so important when goalies um, are young, um, you know, they, they go through the American league because you get, you get the kind of the best of both worlds. You still get the decent quality and decent quantity of practice, uh, but you still get uh, a high uh, volume of games. So, um, but yes, it, you know, it, it, that's, that's why the communication with your goalie and the relationship you have with him is so important, knowing when to back off and when to go a little bit harder um, and, and which guys can take it and which guys can't. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you have, we don't have 23 guys to take care of. You have two, three guys to take care of at the most. And those guys, you got to be in constant communication and, and, and have a trust there that, to know, you know, uh, when to push buttons and when not to. I was going to ask, like, how do you know, like when you, if you're picking one thing and obviously, in, you know, you use the Swedish example of post integration and, and, and hitting them perfectly. Is that a communication thing? Like, Hey, what are we working on today? Or what are we focusing on or really hammering on this week? Uh, is that, do you use statistics to determine that? Do you use video? Is it a back and forth with the goaltender about what they're feeling good about and what they, you know, like sometimes we can practice the things we feel good about too much rather than trying to get better at the things we're not good at. Like how does, how do you come up with the details you're going to work on, you know, whether it's in practice that day or focus on over the course of, you know, that those three or four days between games? Well, before every season, I like to, to sit down with guys and I kind of have a systems video. I show them um, of certain things uh, I think that are fundamental, um, you know, and, and things I've, I've built over the years, again, from working with Clarkie and Francois and Franz, uh, and, and kind of making my own way. Um, so we kind of look at, at that video and kind of pick apart, um, you know, things that fit and don't fit for them. Um, and, uh, and then we try to apply it obviously on the ice and, and, uh, in training camp, it's, uh, it's just about, uh, you know, continuing, uh, those habits and those fundamentals. And then as games, as the season goes on, then, you know, trends start to appear through analytics, through watching the games, um, you know, and sometimes you're starting to get beat in certain situations, then you're obviously going to focus a little bit more on that. I tend to try to not overly focus on negative and try to, uh, you know, try to bring it in a positive way um, in the sense that, you know, if a guy's maybe going through a week where uh, I'll just give an example, a lot of traffic goals have been going in, you know, you'll, you'll maybe touch on it a little bit. You don't want to, you know, you don't want it to him overthinking it. And then all of a sudden, anytime there's a traffic situation, you know, there's certain negative thoughts that creep in. Um, you want to touch on it, but you always try to put a positive spin on it. And I think in the end, I think we were all goalies. And you know that when you're feeling great about yourself on any given day, you could, you feel you can beat anybody. It doesn't matter. So I think I try to bring that. I try to, you know, um, focus on what we need to get better at, but try to put a positive spin on it, you know? Right, right. The last thing you want to do is have them feeling bad about themselves as part of that process. Correct. So I'm trying to, you know, uh, work at improving a certain area of their game, but at the same time, we don't want to forget what makes us good. You know, what's, uh, 
I, I like to maximize the strengths part instead of always focusing on weaknesses and, and that type of thing. So as long as the habits are there, you know, you're doing the right things um, and, you, and you're, you're, you're working at your craft and, you know, you're trying to get better. I think um, regardless of what you're focusing, you're, regardless of what you're focusing on, um, I think the, the results are going to, things are going to turn around if, if you're in a bad spot. And if you're not in a bad spot and if things are going well, well, it doesn't mean you take the foot off the gas. I think you just keep, keep hammering away. And, and I think that's how you, you keep, you sustain your level. Systems and fundamentals you mentioned. When you say systems, I'm assuming you mean goaltender systems in terms of I have a system of play as a goaltender. Um, or do you mean team systems? And is it important that those two sort of fit into each other? I think it's important they fit into each other because, you know, uh, every coach has a certain style they want to play. Um, they have, you know, their D want to play two-on-ones a certain way. And they want to play, uh, and not just long two-on-ones, even short two-on-ones. Right. Uh, they want to play a D zone a certain way. You know, some guys, some Ds are fronting shots. Other Ds are boxing out and letting the goalies see the shot. So I, it plays, uh, it definitely plays a part. So that's why it's so important. Uh, the relationship you have with the head coach and communication there and, and getting on the same page. Um, and I've been working with Jordy. It's going to go on my eighth year now. Um, and so I think we understand each other. We know what we both like and don't like. So um, I think that's what, that's what uh, has, a, that's what has allowed um, a lot of the goalies to have success. To what level, like without giving away too much, again, I, I'm always trying to watch this line, Leo. I, I worry about asking two-pointed questions because I, I don't want to ask you to give away secrets, but um, like would an example be just like a simplistic example, like what the goalie's responsible for in the blue paint on passes from below the goal line? It, it, can that be an example? Like, hey, you just worry about getting across or you're responsible for cutting off certain lanes. Like, is that an example of a coaching preference needing to fit what you work on your goaltenders with? If, if, if Correct. an oversimplistic one on my part. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect example. So, you know, we have that rule where the blue paint is the goal. And I think a lot of teams have that rule. Right. Um, um, so uh, for sure, that's a rule or, um, you know, uh, our, our coach, like I said earlier, worked with Marty Broder. So um, puck handling is a big thing for him. And right. so, um, and I've worked on a lot of teams where, you know, they kind of, you know, the calls and the goalie comes out to stop the puck, but there's no real plan. You know, it's just going on the call of the D. Whereas he likes, we work on it quite a bit as a team, you know, where uh, they want the D in certain spots. And, you know, the goalie has a lot of uh, autonomy to do, make a play. Um, it's about work, getting the players in the right spots for him and, and uh, giving him the, the best chance to make the right play. So, I think uh, that's just a perfect example right there where, you know, uh, a lot of teams maybe won't put an extra emphasis on that. And, you know, a lot of times guys are just waiting on a call from a D or rimming pucks uh, when it's not necessary. So um, that's a good example right there. That's that's an example that requires your goaltenders, like you said, to have a certain skill set, to have the ability not just to make passes, uh, even short ones, but to read four checks not every goalie you get is going to have that as an innate ability. Although I'm guessing more and more of these young kids are coming up with the ability to chuck it and, and manage puck handling decisions. How though, if you get a guy that, Hey, this is our system and we need to be able to do this. Um, you get a guy that's coming up a, a new goalie in the system that, that isn't comfortable with all those touches. What's like, what advice can you give to other goalies and other goalie coaches that, ha- you know, how to get a guy more comfortable handling the puck um, do you use video in terms of helping them read four checks? How do you how do you walk through that process to, you know, to help a, a guy in an area that not everybody excels at? Well, for sure, um, <laughs> I have the best example for this. Uh, my brother played twenty years, and he'll he'll say to himself he was the worst puck handler <laughs> in the NHL. <laughs> but uh, it's something though he would say, you know, if you'd ask him, he'd say he worked at it every day. So I think even though he didn't, uh, you know, he nobody will ever confuse him with Broder or Turco. Um, you know, he did a serviceable job, you know, he, he, he knew what the outs were and it didn't, it doesn't always have to be a 90 yard throw for a touchdown. It could always, it could be a five yard pitch, you know? So, um, I think, uh, I, I, we have goalies right now in the system that are not great puck handlers. Uh, but, um, if you have the right system in place, uh, to, to help them and you can, you know, you work at it every day. 
there's a level of comfort there. You know, I'll give the best example. Uh, I have Mac Guzda in, in Charlotte. And it's not something that, you know, he he's always been ultra comfortable with, but um, he got so much better at it this year. And, you know, he, he used to tell me early on in the year, like, I'm not comfortable, you know, making this play. And then next thing you know, three games later, he's making a pocket pass at the centerman, you know, down the middle. So I'm like, see, you know, it's, it's, it's part confidence. It's just the more you work at it, the more comfortable you feel. And, you know, when there's the, all the right pieces in place and the coach puts a extra focus on it and you're working at it as a team all the time, it just helps them. It helps them get comfortable and be confident. And then, you know, it, it, you're not, I'm not saying you're going to be, uh, you know, making stretch passes for breakaways, but it could have a, uh, a significant impact on your team uh, getting out of its zone a lot quicker. Well, it probably helps, like you said, to have a, a head coach who's focused on it. And it sounds like you get the chance to make those reps in practice. One of the things that, you know, I think when that focus isn't there, it can be tough for goalies because they don't they don't get touches. They don't focus on it in practice, but then they're expected to make it make those plays in the game. And I always think back to Marty Berdur telling us how he got better at, at puck handling was just to handle pucks like plays down at the other end in a practice. He grabs a puck, finds a guy to start chucking to at the like, just get comfortable with it on your stick. And it's funny, I, we were just up in Kelowna and there was a. Uh, uh, Brad Kirkwood from Hockey Canada and Kristen Campbell were two of the goalies uh, and goalie coach partners that were out there at the Net360 camp. And whenever there were two goalies in a drill and the drill started with a pass, she always came and made that first pass. So rather than sitting her there watching her goalie partner all the time, she constantly was making plays and passes with her stick, which just increases that comfort level. I love that as an example. For sure. And those, those little things like making that pass, those for me are separators. You know, when you take charge and you start, you start doing little things like that. I, and, you know, I think that's how you, you get better. And, um, and, and like I said, uh, you know, you're not always going to be the most skilled at it. And, and you mentioned that uh, earlier as well, but uh, if you work at it and, you know, you put focus on it, um, you can improve for sure. You you mentioned head coaches and lessons, and I was curious that as part of that, I, I'm still going through my notes from your opening 12 minutes of your career here. So, um, and and all the mm-hmm. questions that I wanted to ask from it, but lessons from head coaches uh, are there? You know, what do you learn as a goalie coach working with different head coaches? And are there things goalies should be learning from their time with their head coaches, or is it more from a co- you know a, a fellow coach in the goalie role that that you're learning those lessons? And can you give me an example? Well, I think a lot of goalies tend to uh, not pay attention to system stuff, except for maybe PK. Right. Um, but I do think uh, um, knowing how a team plays defensively and how they want to play, uh, you know, breaking out the puck and all that stuff, I think it's it's important. It's important to know the details of that. And a lot of times goalies won't even know, like, what system they play if you ask them. So I, uh, I'm not saying you need to know how to run a power play, but um, <laughs> it's important. I think it's part of hockey sense, you know. It's part of... Uh, it's part of uh, learning the game. And, uh, you know, I think, I think it was on your podcast. I might've heard once that, you know, someone say that Ben Bishop probably has the highest hockey IQ uh, of anyone he's ever met. So, so I think it's, it's, and you saw how good of a goalie he, he was uh, and how good of a puck handler he was. So um, I think it's important that, you know, they pay attention to those little things. As far as uh, the goalie coach, I think, you know, nowadays goalie coaches are, practically assistant coaches and sometimes they're even doing video uh, right. especially in the american league they they have that dual responsibility so they know the systems uh, as well as anybody and and um you know i think that's that helps in terms of what you're doing on the ice uh and 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 when you're doing video with your guys uh in terms of reads and and how we like to play certain situations uh it just helps everybody to get on the same page Okay, so I was going to ask, that was the other thing, because you, you mentioned more of a scouting role now under the the new structure that's in place with the goaltending excellence department in Florida, um, and you're doing more scouting. So I'm guessing hockey IQ, we just talked about, was really important. Like That's something you now have to recognize and see in guys as part of your scouting job. Um, so I guess, I, well, I shouldn't assume that. I guess I guess the question is, is that an important part of what you're looking for? How do you identify it? And is it something that can be taught? Like, can we improve our hockey IQ? Or is there a certain level that by the time you're seeing them for an NHL draft, it's somewhat innate? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's no way to quantify it, but um, there are ways to identify it. I think, um, you know, uh, when you're watching so much video on a guy um, and you see him in 
various situations, um, you can start to to see, um, you know, the the goalies, the said goalies uh, hockey IQ, and if he has it and he doesn't have it, and um, I think it, it's, you know, I think everybody uh, scouting, even when you're scouting a player, you could say the same thing. You really, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to um, to, to evaluate, but you can you can see it over time. You can see it. You can see in plays they make, and it's, it's the same thing for goalies, really. Um, when you start to, to watch several games and, and see um, certain trends, you can you can see when a guy has that hockey IQ. And I think it's something you also do background on a little bit. You know, if you're doing your job, you you want to make sure that the, the the kid or the the prospect that you're bringing into your organization is is a good person, but also a student of the game. Um, you know, does he is it a is it a guy that you know goes home and he doesn't want to know anything about hockey or is it a guy that, you know, goes home and uh, watches, you know, games at night or watches highlights uh, in the morning and, and that's that type of stuff. I think it, it, it's all little things, but it, it adds up and, and then you can kind of, uh, you know, uh, figure out what, whether guys have that hockey sense or not. I was just going to say, does he have a notebook that he, that he, you know, that he keeps on the, cause it's funny, you know, we started with that conversation about how you used to keep this notebook. We started this whole thing with that, but it's amazing to me how many guys I run into at the national hockey league level. And we have conversations like this and that's something they did as a young goalie, you know, like it's not everybody and it's not for everybody, but you know, a lot of the guys, I think if that's your Demko talking about how he used to watch NHL games and make notes on how guys played certain situations and, and, and literally write it in a notebook so he could try it out and practice the next day and see if it worked for him. Like there's something to that, right? That, that sort of desire to learn and try new things and get better that I think, you know, typically those are the guys that are going to have that hockey sense because they've worked to develop it. Yes. And I think, uh, for me, it was, it was that, and it was also, um, <laughs> if you, if you know our family, we're extremely competitive. So uh, <laughs> I'm always, uh, I was always looking to, to, to beat out, uh, you know, when I was playing, like I said, I was smaller. So I was always looking to get that edge. And that was, that was my way of getting it. And, and as a coach, it's the same thing. You know, when I'm playing, uh, I think Mike had a little bit of a chuckle at this, Mike Lawrence. Um, that I said, when I'm playing, even, you know, when we're playing another team, I want to beat out that other goalie coach. Like, that's that's how I feel. Right? So that's that level of compete, and I think it's just how we grew up. You know, we we'd have soccer games at the beach with our with our cousins, and my you know, there's always somebody that ended the game crying, and someone ended up bleeding, and it was always <laughs> uh, ultra competitive. And believe it or not, my my brother was actually in town not long ago, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we were at uh, our parents' house, and somehow the the game connect four came out and it, it was, you know, winter stays. And it was like, we we're all three brothers, my dad, his kids, and we we're all trying to beat them. And uh, it, it got, it got, it got heated for a little bit. And uh, my sister-in-law would be like, is this for real? Is this happening? Connect four, you guys are getting, you know, heated for that. So um, I think it just speaks to like how we were brought up. We we're just always uh, competing at everything we did. And I, it kind of translated for me, uh into coaching that i always wanted to get better i always wanted to uh, to to have the edge on the the next guy so now that would be the perfect way to end this interview but i do have one more question because i'm kind of famous for it leo um and, and but it was in my notes here because you mentioned it and it's something that i noted before the interview started like all all those guys i mentioned at the beginning like you know, one of the things that opened my eyes uh, to, to obviously what you were doing in the American League was how all these guys would always come up and be ready to not just play, but but compete and succeed in the National Hockey League. And the one thing about them is like, man, a lot of different styles, right? Like, like yeah, especially I think of like Hari, Hari Satari and, and Reto, um, you know, even Dreej, like so many different styles. Working with guys who play differently it, you know, it seems to me that as much as you might have some systems and fundamentals, the ability to sort of not bend them or abandon them, but work them into different styles on the other end of, of, of sort of listening and hearing your lessons. Like, how do you go about having that success with guys who play so many different ways? Um, well, again, uh, I'm feeling I'm repeating myself, but it, it actually came from learning from a head coach. Um, when I was at the Spengler Cup, uh, while I was in Lugano, I was working for Team Canada. Um, I got to work with Guy Boucher, and Guy Boucher used to always say, you know, he has to 
he has 23 players and he has to find a way to coach 23 different ways, you know, to reach every player. Uh, and so I felt like that hit home for me. You know, I only have, usually as a goalie coach, you only have one or two guys, maybe three sometimes. Um, and I have to be, uh, in a sense, have to be three different coaches because, you know, different guys have different needs. So um, I think that's when it kind of clicked for me that, you know, it's, yeah, I can't just bring in some cookie cutter, uh, uh, you know, goalie system where the guy, every guy has to play the same way. Cause you know, you got different sizes, different skill sets. So, um, you know, there's a couple of habits and fundamentals, uh, that we talk about that, you know, is, is the basic and, 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 and uh, we want to make sure we're doing those things, but, um, ultimately, you know, guys are, are different and you just have to feel it or you have to be able to reach them and, and, know how to maximize their strength and I think um when that uh, when that happened with working with Guy um I kind of started to really zone in on that and and talking to guys and and really knowing what what makes them good and what what makes them feel good on game days and I think that's how we start developing a plan and I and and we kind of work at it throughout the year it sounds like it's you're, you're, like we always joke that a goalie coach is as much a sports psychologist as a as an on ice coach, and it sounds like getting to know them as people is a is a very important part of that process with you. Not just the the technical and the systems and the fundamentals, but getting to know, like you said, what makes them feel good. Correct, and then and in the end, um, like I said earlier as well, um, the you. you our job is to make them feel great uh, come game time. You know, if they're feeling like they're the best version of themselves, you know, they're gonna they're gonna put out um, their best effort and the, and their best performance. So, I think that's what I work through uh, towards through the whole week. You know, just win your day uh, and 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 get better. And then you know uh, you know you might not see results right away, but at the end of the day you will. And I think um, part of that is is knowing your guys. And knowing, uh, uh, you know, what what they need to work on, but uh, what makes them tick, and 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 what they need to be that that best version of themselves. Okay, last one now. I promise. Are there any non-negotiables in the fundamentals, or or they've all got a little bend to them? Can you give us an example of a fundamental that, again, I feel like I'm putting you on the spot. I don't want to give away too much, but is there a fundament, a couple fundamentals you can share with us that maybe a young kid listening right now might be like? geez, I hadn't thought of that. Like I, I should really make sure I focus on, on this or make they, this should be a part of my game. Well, I think, um, I don't know if you want to say it's, it's, you know, it's no secret, but um, I don't know if you want to say it's, it's a systems thing, but um, I work uh, a ton on footwork. Um, and I, that comes from Clarky, you know, uh, <laughs> I've done the GDI camps where Clarky does an hour of skating, no pucks, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So um, I think, uh, you know, I emphasize that a lot with the guys, you know, it's a non-negotiable for me to, to be able to hit your spots, um, as quickly as possible. So your window of time to make a read is bigger, uh, cause the game is so quick. The shooters are so, uh, precise nowadays, you know, you want to give yourself that extra second to half second, um, to make that read and to help you, uh, track the puck. So for me, we work on it a lot and, you know, I want them to, to, to use the right, um, movement selection in, in certain situations. So they, you know, they're hitting their spots as quickly as possible. So that's kind of a non-negotiable for me. You know, I don't like guys kind of coasting and, 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 you know, uh, kind of gliding out there. I call it surfing. And then, you know, when the shot's about to happen, okay, now I'm getting ready for the shot. It's gotta be, they gotta be engaged a lot earlier than that and be ready for the shot a lot earlier than that. If you can't move, you can't play. That seems to be an increasing sort of, fundamental of of the national hockey league and pro hockey these days especially as it gets so dynamic in front of us as goalies for sure absolutely okay leo this was awesome man thank you so much for taking the time i i probably should have warned you off the hop that it would be close to an hour but uh you've if you've listened to the podcast before you probably know that i tend to ramble on and uh this was awesome this is fantastic so many takeaways that i know our audience is going to enjoy and i can't thank you enough for for taking the time thank you thanks for having me it was great Takeaways. First and foremost, it sure sounds like Roberto. I know they're brothers and they should sound like, obviously, with the genetics. But boy, oh boy, at some point, I 
thought I was listening to Roberto there, Woody. There are a couple spots where the mannerisms in terms of how they talk, it's not just the voice, but the mannerisms are somewhat similar. And yeah, I could see that being con- easily confused. So uh, I just, you know, trying to think of other takeaways that, you know, like, like lessons from head coaches, you know, systems as goaltenders, integrating them into systems as coaches, the things he learned from his times in, in Switzerland, in Sweden. Um, you know, and, and we talked about this. I went back to it with him. And like, how many times do we keep running into goalies that have success? And in this case, a goalie coach that has success. And we hear about a notebook, you know, something yes. they've kept along the way. And I'm not saying every guy needs to have a notebook. Like that's not a make or break thing. But I think the takeaway is you really do. Again, I, I shouldn't say need to be. I careful there. There are no absolutes in this position. But man, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of guys that have success um, that that rise through the path, whether it's as a coach or as a goalie, are really students of the position. And Roberto used to be yeah, like detailed. That. To, yeah, talk about you know constantly evolving, always willing to try new things. And throughout his career, if you're stuck in your ways, a position that evolves so quickly is going to pass you by just as fast. So um, I just I just love that that was a level of detail he got into. And we've heard from guys in the past that just, you know, true students of the position to me, you give yourself a better chance of succeeding. If you really do approach it at the, to that degree, to that level. What do you like Hutch? I texted Woody as I was going through the editing. I said that video that he shows prospects or young goaltenders in the system to talk about how he wants people to play, show examples said, I really want to sit down with Leo and let him show me that video and walk me through it. That's the, that's going to be the in goal premium exclusive exclusive. That's a, yeah, that, that, that's uh, I think that one might have some proprietary stuff in it, but yeah, it's a, I think it might. In fact, in fact, I wanted to so badly that uh, my former billet son, Cooper black, who was at Florida's camp this year, I texted him right away. I said, did you see the video? He did and? not see, he did not see it. So I guess you have to sort of be signed and coming into the system before uh, Leo pulls the video out. Very, well, very sad. Cooper would also like to see the video. Well, the other thing too, that I think goes with that is as much as, you know, we've all got non-negotiables and things that we think need to be a part of the game. I talked about the different styles of the guys that went through that. You have a Harry Sateri of, uh, um, you know, uh, mentioned Ray Tobera, like some of the really unique styles that he's gotten um, you know, Chris Dreger going from, you know, out of the NHL, starting the ECHL, spending time with him up to the NHL. Um, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these uh, guys play unique in different ways. So within the framework of, of his sort of, you know, principles and foundational stuff, there's a there's a flexibility as well to adapt to different preferences and different styles to make sure he's not, you know, limiting you know, his, his ability to connect with different, different goaltenders and different beliefs and different ways of playing the game. Woody, before we let you go, can you tell everybody what you're doing right now? I'm being mauled by my golden retriever who has, uh, I'm, I'm not in my office today. I'm upstairs in, 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 in our bedroom because my daughter's got a friend over and they stayed in the basement, which is where my office was located. They were out late last night. She's 19. Didn't want to wake them up too early. And my golden is now after when my wife was in the vicinity she very she behaved and now that my wife is gone she is on the bed and on my lap and crawling all over me looking for scritches she loves her amazing multitasking amazing well hey there's one thing i can do without thinking it's talk a lot (laughs) hey congratulations on a great uh week up in Kelowna. uh i can't wait for all the content to roll out on ingle and uh, be able to be a fly on the wall and eavesdrop on on what uh, what you guys were able to uh, witness there in person. I, I speak for uh, all of us uh, subscribers uh, and and avid fans of In Goal. This is going to be fascinating to witness. We can't wait to bring it to you, Hutch. You don't have a dog right now, just outside the door. It's usually your puppy that's uh, Doug's yep. usually around there somewhere. Just outside the door, just like me, quite a bit larger than Kevin. Doug, quite a bit larger than Frankie. <laughs> just about, just about twice the size of Frankie. <laughs> really? Oh, Frankie is yeah. Frankie is a retriever only in name. She's only fifty pounds. She's like a lap dog. It's a lot easier because wow. we had her dad. He was like Doug, a hundred pounds, and he thought he was a lap dog too. That was a little tougher to deal yep. with. Uh, we have a lap dog. Hundred pounds no, a lap dog. Uh, if if you feel like it, you're at this point in the podcast. 
send us your pictures and the names of your dogs and what kind of dog you have. Oh, uh, we, we love it. Uh, we love all of our, our, our furry friends. Uh, thanks to Leo Luongo. Thanks to Cam over at the Hockey Shop. Check him out uh, online at thehockeyshop.com in uh, uh, the great uh, source for Sports Langley. And uh, thanks to you for listening as we uh, unpack this summer and a lot of great journeys along the way. We'll talk to you next week on In Goal Radio, the podcast. 